Hey, nice to be here. Um, I'm never really, don't ever go after a VR guy when you're talking. Um, it's pretty big. This is, we're, so I'll talk a little bit about Ala, but sort of how we was asked to talk about how we form the product. Um, by comparison to VR, Ala, we're just unsexy, uncool infrastructure software guys. We're plumbers for the internet. Um, the theory behind this company and uh, sort of everything we're doing is that the internet is expanding. And so the Internet of Things is really, it's actually just the Internet, and uh, technology is coming together to now grab and evolve into things and disrupt that market. So our company is, was there to sort of uh, fill that gap. Let me see if I can figure out the tech. Okay, so Internet of Things, I guess lots of markets are big. It's interesting, there aren't many markets I've been in where they use the T. We always kind of throw around the B. Now, you know, Gartner and everyone, you know, uses trillion for uh, this market. Now, it's really because it's just the internet. The internet is massive and it sort of evolves outwards. And so things is just the next frontier of connectivity and networking. So we're going from DARPA and ARPANET and, you know, nuclear attack stuff to, you know, connecting lights and, and so on around us. So very, very big market. Um, the challenge is, it, it, it is interesting, the, the words Internet of Things are, um, well, why, why do we talk about it that way? I think the most interesting thing about the market, and this kind of gets into when we started the company, I'll sort of just tell it from history, is that the Internet to date has actually been about massive, massive homogeneity. So we connect PCs, and all PCs, you have Wintel. I used to be at Intel a long time ago, and so um, all PCs are essentially the same. Uh, there used to be maybe 25, 50, 150 manufacturers, but now there's maybe a handful. The same with mobile. Mobile connecting humans, almost everyone here um, has a smartphone. We have mobile internet now. Uh, that's how we access the internet probably mostly today. And again, there's only a handful of manufacturers that matter. That's actually why there's so much consolidation in the chip se sector today. The interesting thing is it's not really going to happen in the Internet of Things market. Now, I'll explain exactly why that's so interesting. They're, the door lock manufacturer is not going to make water heaters or air conditioners or thermostats or door entry or, or lights. And so this is a software challenge. The, the, the Internet has not really been about hardware. Hardware and software come together to enable systems so a PC can connect. And that was kind of cool. Um, I, I don't know, I can measure time sometimes through uh, the kids we've had. And my, my first kid, I had a pager and, and no, no cell phone even. And it was like the late 90s or some, sometime around there. Um, and, and then I got a cell phone, and, but definitely nothing that we have today. It's just dramatic how much now networking and connectivity is, is everywhere. In the year 2000, there were 7 million Wi-Fi chips sold worldwide. I mean, it's amazing now how much this is all changing. IP is everywhere. And yet, if you build software for PCs and mobile, you just build it for Wintel. And you build for Android and iOS. So how do we do this for things? So Ayla, I guess when we started the company, we, my, my last company actually was making Wi-Fi chips. It was sold in 2010. And we realized that no one really cared about a better chip. And it was really expensive to make a chip company. It was all software. And so we set out to say, how can we solve the fragmentation? Uh, Salesforce.com, which is infrastructure or, or others, they don't do new software for you just because whatever you're using. They, they have one set of software. So that was our goal, make one set of software for all things. I think just to talk through IoT, um, this is from our marketing. But, but, but there are a lot of moving pieces. Right now, uh, first of all, the manufacturers who make things don't know what Berkeley socket is. I mean, they don't know what moving a certificate is. Ruby and Java sound like an island and, and, a, and something. Anyway, so this is the, the capabilities at the companies that are trying to connect things don't exist. Now, that's great, actually, for Ayla. We are, in, in effect, actually, instead of every company recreating the wheel, we said we could be that infrastructure. Instead of everyone building what Tony Fidel had with Nest, has, we would be that infrastructure. There's a great opportunity because the companies that are about to get impacted by the internet have no clue. 
And there are a lot of moving parts. There's cloud, there's applications, there's, you have to connect up to their SAP type stuff and so on. And there's a whole bunch of different systems that need to be connected. And of course, security, privacy, all those things have to be solved. Now, I only have a couple slides here. I, I just wanted to explain our thought processes around building the company. Now, there's a lot of people sort of talking about the history. There were four of us in a kitchen taking no comp. We started the company in 2010. And if you went to a venture investor in 2010 and say, all right, I'm building a platform for the Internet of Things, they would look up from their BlackBerry and say, what's that? And then say, what, what things are you making? So no one cared. We self-funded for a couple years. And we raised an A round in Q411. And although funding is hard all the time, that was brutal. We had to talk to 50 to 75 folks to get one who is, I, I call it an investor with a high appetite for risk. Um, it's changed since then, so the, the investing sentiment has changed. But we looked at this problem and identified the fact that the Internet of Things is this awesome, cool thing, but there's huge friction. There's massive friction, all really driven by the fragmentation and the fact that the company's needing to connect to have zero capability. So I, I wanted to walk through, and I'll be very fast here. Uh, the one thing we knew about an Internet of thing, thing is it would have compute in it. The other thing we knew is it had to add networking of some sort. It wouldn't join the, network, the Internet that way. We figured if the leading chip companies would put our software in their chips, it would all connect to our cloud service, and it would make everything work great. My co-founder was an architect at Amazon building Kindles. That was kind of, we said, we could take the, all that awesome stuff in the Kindle. By the way, I'm a history major, so awesome stuff is about the level I know there. It connects up to our cloud, and it would work. But we did get that. I mean, today, Broadcom, Qualcomm, Marvell, MediaTek, all these companies put our software in production, in their chips, it connects up to our cloud. We solved a massive hurdle. We don't ever have to write any new software, regardless of whether it's a HEPA filter or an air conditioner or a door lock or a light. Um, we built this to future-proof. It's a new market. I guess what I would say is we understood that we didn't know most of what would happen in the Internet of Things. So when we built the market, uh, uh, the product, we realized being agile with the technology, let alone how we built the company, um, was critical. We couldn't understand what the data would be, so we had to architect for not knowing. Um, it was an interesting thing, and I, my last slide, I talked about it. In the beginning, it was field of dreams, and it was statistics. Statistically, we knew about 1% of what the market would be. And it's an interesting thing as an entrepreneur. You have to build in for what you don't know and know that you can evolve into it. I think we ended up doing that well. We actually kind of made this to be agnostic to data and protocols. And we understood maybe a couple guesses we made right that the world might evolve towards HomeKit hadn't existed yet. But we figured, is everyone going to want 50 apps to control their home? No. So there will be some mega app or the Uber app or Uber then came along and took that. But we, we thought there'd be some super app. And we built in a way that all the devices on our cloud could connect up to one app to control it. We actually demonstrated this in China with WeChat. So WeChat can actually control 10 products. WeChat never spoke to those guys, but it's a cloud to cloud thing. The other thing is we're global. Ayla took a huge risk early on by going into China during our A round, but only because my founder, one of my co-founders, has relationship. I would. Uh, say that China is a huge shiny object for most startups and I would never counsel going there unless you have um, a lot of alcohol and also uh, someone with great relationship. Um, so anyway, this is what we thought through as we built the, built the product out. Um, now being in China for us though turned out to be again a massive bet. We now have 35 people in China, a third of our company is in China, we, have, we operate, we're licensed in China. It, I guess we sort of knew this, but in hindsight, if half the world's stuff is made in a region and you're not in the region, then you're going to struggle, actually. And even our customers in North America and Europe, they build stuff and test it in China. And if you're trying to get in and out of the firewall, uh, that was a headache before we were in China. So um, we, that, we're the blue dot down there. I actually spend a week a month in China. Um, I'm sleep deprived, though, so I want that other product. And I, I think I was sleep deprived before the jet lag, so jet lag doesn't get me that much. But um, this is, is heavy, heavy lifting that it was a big bet that is paying off for us. 
Interestingly enough, our B round was led from China. We are, it's a good time to raise funding. Uh, there's a huge amount of money in China, actually, if you have a business that uh, has a meaningful strategy that involves China. There's more money in China now than the US. It's hot money still. Um, so there's a graphic of what the ALA product does. Again, I was sort of asked to talk about this. Um, I guess, again, in a way, we evolved this so that there would be this massive flexibility around system design. So for all of you guys who think about IoT, IoT doesn't mean the cloud does it. It just means the cloud is probably involved, but you have a system that may or may not be smart. You may have real-time activities that happen on a system. You may mono you should be able to build a system that is optimized for what you're trying to do. You may have a lot of intelligence in an application, a third-party app, your cloud service, or down at the device. Um, it's building things in a new market where you build in inflexibility. Think of a, a spreadsheet with a whole bunch of hardwired cells. It was really a good idea to get something done quickly, and then you hate it. Um, I was a finance guy in New York, actually, early on. So that was one thing I always hated. So now our goal and our view of Internet of Things is that the networking of the Internet is not, we've always found it's not the value. That's the means to the end, I guess. There's, there's great value to provide the infrastructure so any company can do it. But as we found in every other stage of the Internet, it's what you do for the data. We built, again, it was one of our early bets. Manufacturers are really going to care about their data. They don't know it yet. We, we don't go in selling data. We go in, hey, Johnson Controls, you can make a connected thermostat too, but you don't have to hire 20 people. You know, and, and so our customers are guys like Johnson Controls, United Technologies, larger companies. But we can put this in front of them, and it's amazing. It's like Nielsen on steroids at the very beginning. Now, very quickly, some people talk about data and data analytics and machine learning. I think of this as sort of like uh, crawl. You, you slither from the muck in the beginning. So you can see your data, going from having zero idea how your products are being used, what features where, just to see what features are being used and where your products are. If you can look at a launch and see where products go over time, this is amazing to these people, let alone why is your dishwasher broken, exactly what make, model, and year, and I'll send somebody with the right part. That's all sort of the crawling part of data here. Eventually, you get to machine learning and so on once you have enough data. But it's kind of cool. Uh, so we architected with this in mind. Our entire architecture is built to be extraordinarily flexible around data and to be able to essentially have an application delivery vehicle once you have all these things connected to the platform. We thought that was an important area to focus. Again, very hard thing at a start, though. We're not making our money on this yet. We're investing. Um, you investing appropriately to the amount of funding you have so you can get the customers, let alone the future. So we've made some bets on this um, with a significant investment that are starting to pay off. Now, in summary, as the title says here, I just thought it was an interesting thing. I heard one of the earlier guys say something actually very similar is, in a new market, you're basically doing field of dreams. You're making bets. And since you have very little information, you still have to go forward and it's kind of like your business is your collection of options. If you make it all in in one thing, you better, better, better be right. Um, whenever you can, don't go all in. Um, I, I love playing Texas Hold'em too. But, but again, sometimes you need to, and it's a great thing to do. But we built in massive flexibility in our platform. We even built, we run on Amazon. We thought we would go into China. We built in so that uh, we could go on any cloud. Right now, and that meant we spent 20% more investment just making sure we didn't tie ourselves to one architecture. Now we're doing a little bit different. So anyway, we went from field of dreams. We made some good bets, some mistakes. We've now gone to lots of customers telling us what to do. And that hurts too, by the way, because we're, now, we're actually now at the phase of more official product management that helps you understand ROI and prioritization versus the whim of the VP of engineering. Um, uh, or me. And, and anyway, that, that's where it is. It's, um, it's been fun, but thank you. Chris, thank you. Um, you uh, touched upon 
numbers here, but tell us a little bit more about um, your customer use cases. Or how do people use this platform? So, you can talk about it. so our customers make, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the ones that are announced, but they make air conditioners. They make door locks. What happens is Nest launches and a bunch of thermostat companies say, I need this. And they, it would take them a long time to get this and put all this together. I guess August raises a lot of money, and we get these giant door entry guys. Um, air conditioners are a big moving, uh, big category. There's a lot of remote control. There's a lot of uh, warranty and service and prevent truck rolls. We have uh, commercial water heaters from a company called A.O. Smith, and it really talks to the service every six hours, just says, I'm good, except when it's not good, and then it tells you why it's not good. So um, remote diagnostic management, and then giving consumers control and, and so on. And you, there's an element of retrofitting to, or do they include the what, a sensor in the next generation of, of products? Because those guys tend to have like huge, older footprints of installed products. Yeah, our architecture allows us, if you make an air conditioner today, to make a tiny little translation chip. Now, we don't make the chip, but they, they basically put a little card in, and this is the, the 1.0, is don't change your entire air conditioner. Make that little card that reads stuff and goes to this communications module, which is essentially a modem to the cloud. And then there's a virtual device in the cloud. So the, most cases, they change 10% of the product, the board space and a little bit extra code. Some companies, though, do total greenfield. You know, they, they, they're building their first connected thermostat. And with that being to Yeah, mostly we're in Wi-Fi. So one thing we thought of is if you need a smart gateway for the Internet of Things, it won't take off. Because which one? Is it going to be the Comcast gateway or the Google or Apple? So we got our software and the Wi-Fi chips to start because we figured everyone would have Wi-Fi. And so basically it's like Nest. You bring it home, you download the app, the app finds the device, it registers and magic happens or, or whatever. But nothing, no, no rocket science. Everyone wants beer. Um, and uh, tell us about, uh, I guess, the company, the team. Um, how did you, you know, build it originally? How are you scaling it now? So there's always interesting for people here who are building companies. That you, you get the hardware guys, you get the data guys, you get the software guys, you get everything yeah. at the same time. What do you outsource? OK, so very quickly, most of us are, you know, have teenagers, kids in college, so we've done startups before and made lots of mistakes. It's easier having done several now to be doing this one. It's always easier because you learn as you go. Um, we're really different founders, so one guy is just the BD master of China. I'm a history major and I've just sort of business, and another was a, is an architect from Amazon. And uh, it's good. Our brains are like sine waves meeting the digital. We crush each other in a room, but about three hours of, of, of debate leads to a much better result. We know that, so we just let it flow, and we laugh and have no problem with it. Um, the company's grown from four. We self-funded for years, which was a little painful. Um, and then we raised an A round, and then a B round, raising more. So we're over 100 people now. Um, the growth is excruciating, it's good and it's bad. So we've had the non-growth excruciating pain, which is much more excruciating. Um, this is now frustratingly, who's now responsible for this? And uh, we hit a really hard hiring target to find we're still about halfway where we need to be because the market timing just worked out, that's all. And so um, normally we have to apologize to investors for not meeting targets now. Whatever. Anyway, it's just good, good fortune this time. All right, this is very well. Congratulations on everything you've, uh, you guys have achieved since it was uh, a great journey and some ways just started. Yeah. The market timing seems perfect. So. Yeah, great. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.